chart. I'm going to take you real quickly through what I do when I interpret a cone beam CT. This is just a 65 year old patient. This was taken on an ICAT flex machine. And so first you open it up, you look at it. Uh, you know, may notice it's a little bit grainy and you can fix that by increasing the slice thickness. So what that does is shows you basically more than one slice at a time. If you have it set to zero, then you're just looking at one slice. It can be kind of noisy or grainy looking. Uh, then you adjust the brightness and contrast. That looks pretty good for what we're looking at, which is mostly hard tissues. And you do see a little bit of the soft tissue contrast between the layers of fat and loose connective tissue and what's muscle or even salivary gland looks really similar to muscle in cone beam CT. If you want to emphasize the soft tissue, you, you can do that. Of course, then we're trying to see contrast of these low contrast structures that may help to increase that slight slice thickness so by that you decrease some of the noise you're able to see a little bit more contrast but still in cone beam CTs you're never able to really get a good soft tissue contrast like you would in a medical CT so when you have it looking like you want and this is pretty good I can see pretty much everything I want you know, make sure the orientation is normal everything's straight that looks pretty good then you have to go through slice by slice. I like to start with the axial. I'll start at the bottom here. So I'm just dragging this line down to the very bottom and that drags the axial slice to the bottom slice. And I'm gonna leave this at about 0.5 millimeters. So it's a little less grainy than if I had it at seven, but it slows down a little bit when you increase too much. So you have to look at everything in the image and so the question is how do you do that if you're scrolling through so fast there's several hundred images I think a, a good tip is to look at about a third of the image at a time you divide the third horizontally into or divide the image horizontally into thirds so here I look at the top or in this case it's the anterior third of the image and then I'm right now I'm just kind of looking at the the neck the platysma and the soft tissues you look for symmetry you scroll up Look for anything that looks like some swelling. Uh, maybe his cheeks kind of stand out, but they're just being compressed by the chin rest there. And it's the same on each side. So look in the soft tissues as well as the hard tissues. Once you get to the hard tissue, you look for continuous lines. You look for anything that might look like a fracture, obviously. You want to make sure the cortexes or the cortices are uniform and they look the same from side to side. In the axial and in the coronal slices, you can look for symmetry, so that's important. We scroll up, we start to see the teeth in the mandible. Everything's symmetric. I don't see any root canals in these anterior teeth. Teeth are a little out of line, but of course we see that. Here I'm starting to get into to the maxillary sinuses. Here I see the signs of mucosal thickening of the maxillary sinuses and that's really common. You'll probably see that on most patients. This I might classify as a moderate thickening. If you want to look in an, another plane, you can do that. Just drag this or use the scroll wheel here. This kind of stands out a little bit of hyperdensities in the alveolar bone. But that just looks like probably residual roots of a tooth that was extracted there. So keep going up, keep going up. And same thing for the borders of the maxilla. You want to make sure they're thin and continuous. If you see thickening of the posterior border or the lateral border of the maxillary sinus, that's a sign of chronic sinusitis. Chronic because for born, bone to form, it has to have taken a significant amount of time. So they have to have had an infection ongoing long enough for born, bone to form. So then let's scroll back through looking at the middle third so maybe I'm looking from here to here so here I see the pterocolon maxillary fo uh, fossae I'm seeing inside the nasal cavity here at the very top I'm seeing the nasal lacrimal ducts and we just get part of the orbits not much scroll inferiorly we know this is one of the turbinates of course it's easier to tell in the coronal plane, so we look at the middle turbinate here, and the inferior turbinate will extend a lot more anteriorly, so you could tell that 
just by looking there if you're good. So here we see the interior turbinates. And I'll look really in depth through the coronal plane when I'm going through the coronal to make sure the airspace in the nasal cavity is patent. And you gotta account for every foramen, every canal that you see. So here we see a canal. You may know what that is. Some of you may an anesthetize it, and that's the greater palatine canal. Of course, of course, posterior to that, you see the lesser palatine canal. And you can kind of follow those up as you scroll through. You can see those in other planes as well. So we're scrolling down. I still haven't talked much about the base of the skull. I'll get to that next. You want to make sure the airway is symmetric. It doesn't have to be perfectly symmetric, but if something stands out, you know, it could be a tumor. It could be something significant. So you want to really look there. Here we see a couple of calcifications. So if you were following where those came from, you can scroll up or back and forth, or you can zoom the crosshairs on it, and you'll see that that connects to the medial pterygoid plate, which makes it just the hamulus. And they'll do this a lot where they kind of stand out separate and it looks like some abnormal calcification. And so we also see kind of a similar effect here. As we see little, little dots of calcification in the neck. But it, especially if you look in the sagittal plane, you can tell just what that is. That's going right to the styloid process. And so all that is is a little bit of calcification of the stylohyoid ligament. <clears throat> You get a lot of people that see that and they immediately jump to, oh, well, they have Eagle Syndrome. And I'll just tell you, a good percentage of people have calcification of the stylohyoid ligaments. I would say maybe 30% that I've seen. But I've yet to see a case of actual Eagle Syndrome. And that's diagnosed based on symptoms. Even people that have really thick, uh, kind of egregious looking calcifications they don't have any symptoms and I'm not going to diagnose Eagle syndrome from it so only if there's symptoms turning their head they get lightheaded some people pass out then they might have Eagle syndrome but again I've never seen it and I've seen plenty of calcifications so we keep, keep scrolling through again I'm looking at the middle portion of the axial plane here we can follow the inferior alveolar canal as it goes past this wisdom tooth I'm looking in here. Maybe I think I see something. I go back. Okay, we're further down. We're starting to see the epiglottis, but the airway is patent and looks pretty normal. Let me go back up here a little bit. Sometimes you'll see little calcifications here. And again, if you wonder what that is, drag the other planes on it, or just scroll up and down through the plane that you're in. This makes it pretty clear that that's part of the hyoid bone. So we're looking at the greater horn of the hyoid bone. And you'll see that as you scroll down, it connects to the rest of the hyoid bone. But then we see a couple more calcifications bilaterally here. So let's drag our cursor on that. And this is not the hyoid bone. This is not a normal anatomical structure. And so what could that be? And we've seen on panels a lot that you recognize calcified carotid arteries or carotid arth artery atheromas that have calcified. And these, this is the typical location for it. It'll be a little bit lateral and posterior to the airway. And on a vertical level, it'll be about even with C3 or C3 or C4, either the uh, third or fourth cervical vertebrae. And that is just in line with the, this is two. So this is one, two, three, four. That's just at that level, the C3, C4, that's where the carotid artery bifurcates into the internal and external carotid arteries. And that's typically where you start to see that atheroma plaque build up. We'll also see it sometimes up in the internal as it's proceeding through the cranium. You can see calcifications there. And so it's important to remark on there's different opinions on whether they should be referred. There's a lot of other significant factors. This is pretty slight calcification. I'm, I'm not worried of stenosis or blocking of the artery, but some studies do say that any amount of calcification increases the likelihood of an ischemic event, a stroke. So the patient, I think, should be made aware that they have other risk factors like high blood pressure. Maybe you do want to refer them to their doctor 
at least uh, a written referral. And if you see a lot more severe where it does look like there's stenosis or where it's actually looks like it's blocking the lumen of the artery, that's obviously a more significant case. And so one last time through this, as we look at the inferior part of the axial view. So here we're looking at the cervical spine. We see the vertebral artery foramen. Looking at soft tissues, looking at hard tissues, everything here in the inferior portion. Comparing both sides as you kind of slowly scroll up frame by frame. Nothing else is really standing out so far. So here we're going to get to the base of the skull and I can talk more about the foramina of the base of the skull. Some people don't like to hear about it. They think you're just showing off when you start talking about anatomy, but if you don't know the anatomy and you're not accounting for each of the foramina, what business do you have interpreting this image where you're held liable for everything that can be captured in the field of view? That's my opinion at least. So here we see these are completely black. So if it's completely black, that means it's air. So this has to be something filled with air. And these are just the mastoid air cells, which you'll see more posteriorly, but frequently like this, they will aerate more anteriorly into this part, which is called the petrous portion of the temporal bone. Petrous meaning rock-like because it's hard. And this kind of stands out as different from the rest. That's the carotid artery, the internal carotid artery as it's ascending through the base of the skull. And so this is a part of the skull base we just call the clivus, part of the occipital bone. Here we're seeing the TMJ, uh, the condyle, and surrounding it is uh, part of the temporal bone. And here I see a couple things that look like foramina. Something here, kind of a similar thing on the other side. So these are bilateral, these are a natural anatomical structure. You can look at it in other planes. You can definitely see it's a canal. So we'll drag this over here now. And what that is is the foramen spinosum, if you remember from anatomy. And then sometimes we just get kind of enlarged trabeculae. So as we scroll up, this looks a little different. This looks a little more concerning than something that I would just classify as enlarged trabeculae, especially now it just keeps opening up more and more. And here we see another one. Okay, we'll get back to that. Let's go through some more of the normal anatomy. I see we see another hole kind of opening up here, another foramen, and that's bilateral. That's normal anatomy. You may know already what that is. That's the foramen ovale. And again, look in other fields or other planes. It's clear that that's a foramen and it's the foramen of ovale. Let's scroll this back a little bit, maybe see it on the opposite side. So bilateral, symmetric, normal anatomy. But this one I've pointed out are these couple of different hypodense structures. That's not bilateral. So let's put our crosshairs on that and see what we see. We can see in the sagittal plane, there is in fact quite a bit of a hypodensity extending almost through. In fact, it looks like it perforates into the glenoid fossa region. Maybe a little bit more anteriorly as well. So this is the type of thing you should be looking for when you're viewing cone beam CT. There as well, a little bit of a hypodensity kind of extending from the intracranial surface. This is the middle cranial fossa into the temporal bone here. It's not symmetric. Is it something we should be worried about? Here's a good view of both of the main ones. 
And this, because it's coming from the intracranial, and because of the way it looks, kind of undulating borders, but they're well-defined, they're corticated, these are completely consistent with an anatomical variation known as arachnoid granulations. So the arachnoid is part of the, the mater that covers the brain, or part of the meninges that cover the brain. You have the pia mater, the arachnoid mater, and the dura mater. And this is just a herniation of arachnoid through the dura mater. And it tends to resorb a little bit of the inside of the cranium and the inside of the skull. And so we see that in various areas. It's something to remark on, something to comment about, but just the way it looks, it's pretty s distinct the way the, the borders look. We can be sure that that's all that it is and it's nothing to worry about. If it were coming from the other side, from within the glenoid fossa, then you might start thinking about osteoarthritis. And maybe I'll talk about that real briefly. So osteoarthritis, is, of course, we have to look for that in the TMJs, the temporomandibular joints. Signs of that, there are several thickening or sclerosis of the cortical border, or just kind of thickening of the hyperdense region. This one looks pretty normal. Of course, I would always look in the TMJ views and get a real nice cross-sectional view to the TMJ, but just for the sake of showing you. So the first one is sclerosis. You'll see flattening or remodeling. Uh, you can also see hypodensities, or if you lose the cortication or start to see kind of a hypodense or radiolucent, radiolucency into the bone, that would be erosion. Maybe you'll just see a hypodense, round, perfectly round structure, and that's known as a subcortical cyst. That'll be usually in the cortex of bone or a little bit below the cortex. So those are all signs of osteoarthritis as well as osteophyte formation. And I can show you an example of that in this case. Because a lot of people get this here in the cervical spine, they get osteoarthritis as well. And so you want to count your cervical spine. The first one, C1, is known as the axis. It's just a ring shape. So here we just see the anterior arch of the axis. And this little projection is not normal. That's an osteophyte formation. And looks like a little bit of one as well on C2. So this is C2. It has a finger-like projection that projects up through the center of the ring of the axis. And this is called the dens. So this would be the Atlanto atlantoaxial joint. Uh, another sign I didn't mention is loss of joint space and you definitely see that here. You don't see any space between C2 and C1. You see thickening and sclerosis of the cortex. And this whole thing kind of looks sclerotic. You get kind of a varied appearance of the dens in general. Uh, you also see a little osteophyte projection here off the occipital bone, the base of the skull. Uh, this area is known as the clivus. The single point that's in the middle center line, base of the skull, is known as the basion. So there's a osteophyte pro projection off the basion. That's pretty typical. You'll see it on most people as they age. They get a little bit of osteoarthritis here. Let me take you back to where we were looking in the axial plane. So you want to look for your ear hole, which is, of course, the external acoustic canal. And as you move superiorly, you, s you can see the internal acoustic canal. And then look for about where those come together. And then you see the internal parts of the ear, the ossicles, which you can see pretty well in comb beam CT. So you need to know what normal ossicles look like. And then the inner ear parts, which is the vestibule where the ossicles join. And on the anterior surface, you'll see the cochlea. You scroll through that a little bit. And posteriorly and attached to the vestibule, you see the semicircular canals. This doesn't show all of them. But you just want to look at each of these areas, make sure things look well defined. They have corticated borders that you don't have some additional hypodensity that doesn't belong or swelling, but this, everything looks normal. And then we get a little extension of air anterior medially. And if you follow that, that kind of extends through a canal. This is just the eustachian canal, the posterior part of which is a bony canal. 
and the anterior part of which is cartilaginous. And here you see a couple of canals. They're bilateral and they're symmetric. Let's blow that up. And these extend as you follow them forward into the pterygopalatine fossa. And this canal is pretty easy to remember because it's just the pterygoid canal, also known as the Vidian canal. And some people will confuse this with the foramen rotundum. Foramen rotundum you'll see as you scroll more superiorly. And that projects here out of the pterygomaxillary fossa. It's good to look at these in the coronal view as well. So let's put our crosshairs on that. And this is kind of a standard appearance of the foramen rotundum as we scroll anteriorly. Now we see these two canals more inferiorly, really traveling through the sphenoid bone into the pterygopalatine fossa. And this looks a little funny here. It looks like there's additional canals. If you noticed in the axial, looks like it has some extra canals. And that caught my eye at first when I was reviewing this case. I've never seen it quite look like this. But sometimes that pterygopalatine fossa will just kind of extend posteriorly. And as, as you follow this, it doesn't really go anywhere. It's not a real canal. It's not pathology. That was just a little interesting variation. But again, I think things like that should catch your eye. You should be accounting for the normal anatomy. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. I went ahead and recorded as I went through each of the two other slices. But I can hear people just groaning and bored. And if you made it this far, congratulations to you. And if you're interested in seeing more as I go through the other sli orientations, the sagittal and the coronal, please email me because I have it recorded and I'd love to keep posting these videos and I'll bring up some more interesting cases if that's what people are interested in but I think there's a lot of people that just need this basic interpretation 101 and I think it's important and as you can see I think anatomy is the key that's if you know and you can recognize the anatomy you're 90 percent of the way there and so email me with any questions check back in I'll post more videos let me know what you're interested in. Thanks.